my clock is clicking over to 5.30, so I will <clears throat> call the statutory public meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. Uh, any amendments to the agenda, Clerk? None. That the uh, motion to confirm that the agenda for the statutory public meeting of October 20th, 2021 be approved as presented. Moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Lego. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Declarations of pecuniary interest. I'm sorry, three, Mayor Lawrence. I have none. Thank you. Voyagers, Voyagers North Road East, zoning bylaw amendment number Z08-2021 application. The applicants are Thomas and Carol Terry. Introduction and overview. This public meeting is being held pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990 chapter page 13 as amended. The applicants own 89 Voyagers North Road East and are currently in the process of purchasing adjacent crown land to merge with the existing patented land. The applicants are also in the process of completing a consent application, C06-2021, to purchase a small sliver of land from their neighbor, neighbors at 76 Voyagers North Road East to also be merged with the existing patented land. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the small portion of the land that will be transferred to the applicants through the consent application. The land would be rezoned to the tourist commercial exception one, CT-1 zone, to match the existing zoning of the subject land established earlier this year by bylaw 48-21. The zoning bylaw amendment is also required to permit the reduced lot areas of 89 Voyagers Road, North Road East and 76 Voyagers North Road East as they do not meet the one hectare requirement of the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw amendment is a condition of consent C06-2021. The planning coordinator will confirm how notice was served to advertise the public meeting. For you, Mayor Lawrence, notice was circulated to internal staff and external bodies by email. Notice was advertised in the Sioux Bulletin and on the municipal website and social media, sent by mail to property owners within 120 meters of the subject property uh, and various agencies, and signs were posted at the property entrance. Thank you. The planning coordinator will provide a summary of the application. Through you, Mayor Lawrence. So an application for zoning bylaw amendment was submitted by Thomas and Carol Terry on behalf of the owners at 89 Voyagers North Road East and the property at 76 Voyagers North Road East, which is owned by Heidi Engel and Werner Stinsey. The applicant has been granted a provisional consent for a boundary adjustment, specifically a lot addition, which modified the lot line between 89 Voyagers North Road East and 76 Voyagers North Road East. The lot addition adds a 600 square meter portion of land to the Terry property at 89 Voyagers North Road East from the property at 76 Voyagers North Road East. The purpose of the lot addition was to facilitate the building of a new accessory dwelling unit on the land. As a result of the provisional consent approval, 89 Voyagers North Road East is proposed to be split zoned between the residential shoreline zone and the tourist commercial exception one zone. The zoning bylaw amendment is a condition of provis provisional consent. The amendment is required to rezone the small portion of land that was added to 89 Voyagers North Road East from the residential shoreline zone to the tourist commercial exception one zone in order to match the existing zoning of the parcel and allow the proposed accessory dwelling unit. The zoning bylaw amendment is also required to permit the reduced lot area, both 89 Voyagers North Road East and 76 Voyagers North Road East. Following the provisional consent, 89 Voyagers North Road East has a proposed lot area of 0.66 hectares, though its zoning, the CT1 zone, requires a minimum of one hectare. Following the provisional consent, 76 Voyagers North Road East has a proposed lot area of 0.64 hectares, though its zone, the RS zone requires a minimum of one hectare. The zoning bylaw amendment would legalize the minimum lot area for both 89 Voyagers North Road East and 76 Voyagers North Road East. Staff are re recommending that a lot area of 0.6 hectares be approved for both properties. Staff are also recommending that the zoning bylaw amendment be passed 
as it is our opinion that the application is consistent with the PPS and conforms to the official plan. Thank you. The planning coordinator will read out any correspondence received from government agencies and municipal staff. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, there were no comments received from government agencies or municipal staff. The planning coordinator will read out any correspondence received from the public. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, there was no correspondence received from any members of the public. Thank you. The applicant or a representative is invited to speak to the application. Is there a representative here or the applicant? Uh, yes, Tom Terry's here. Hello, Tom. Hi. Um, no, I have nothing to add. Um, the, the details were covered well, and uh, and we're grateful for the recommendation. So it allow us to move forward with what we're planning. Thanks, Tom. Uh, questions from uh, members of council? Any questions? I see no hands. Yes, Councillor Lego. Yeah, just uh, one thing under option one, I just noticed that there might've been a typo. Um, if we can go to that, it says uh, that council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 9721, being bylaw to amend bylaw 8515. Is that supposed to be 8518? Just so it's uh, correct. Mayor Lawrence, yes, uh, that is correct. That was a typo, thank you. Um, that's all I have for this. Um, we covered this at the Committee of Adjustment, so I'm, I'm quite fine with what's going on with the, the Terry's property. Thanks, Councillor Lego. Any further comments or questions, Council? I see none. Are there any members of the public present, Clerk, that I should ask for comments? Um, Mayor Lawrence, I don't believe there are any members of the public who wish to speak to this particular application. Uh, perhaps we can just pause for a moment, but I don't believe there are. Hearing or seeing none, uh, Clerk, I'll take your advice uh, on reading the next section 7-2. I do read it. I do, I must read it. All right, thank you. Um, the members of the public are invited to speak to the application. The public can ask questions or clarification or seek background information, speak in support of the application or speak in opposition to the application. All questions will be directed through the chair. It is requested that only one question be asked at a time. Please identify yourself before you ask your question so that you can properly be recorded in the minutes of the public meeting. And again, I see no members of the public or hear none. So we'll move on to conclusion and closing of the public meeting. This concludes the public meeting regarding zoning bylaw amendment number Z08-2021. If any member of the public wishes to be notified of the decision of council in respect of the application, you must make a written request to the planning coordinator. Notice to appeal the decision of council to the Ontario Land Tribunal must be filed with the planning coordinator no later than 20 days from the date of the notice of the decision is circulated. The notice of appeal shall be sent to the attention of the planning coordinator and it must include the following information. The reasons for the appeal and the fee as prescribed under the Ontario Land Tribunal Act in the amount of $1,100 payable by certified check to the Minister of Finance, Province of Ontario. Only individuals, corporations or public bodies may appeal the decision of council to the Ontario Land Tribunal. An appeal may not be filed by an unincorporated association or group. A notice of appeal may be filed in the name of an individual who is a member of the association or group. We have two options, and since there were no opposing comments tonight, I think I will read option one as the uh, resolution that council receives the planning report dated October 20th, 2021, respecting zoning bylaw amendment number Z08-2021, and further, the council authorized the passing of bylaw number 97-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 85-18, being a comprehensive zoning bylaw for the corporation of the municipality of Sulicote as amended. 89 Voyagers North Road East. Moved by. Councillor Fanlin, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any final discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. We'll now move on to our second application. Sunset Inn, 10 First Avenue South, official plan amendment number OP04-2021. 
2021 and zoning bylaw amendment number Z09-2021 application. The applicant, Fusion Capital Corporation on behalf of Sunset Inn Incorporated. Introduction and overview. This public meeting will be held pursuant to sections 17, 22, and 34 of the Planning Act RSO 1990, chapter P13 as amendment and amended to inform the public and to obtain their input with respect to a proposed amendment to the Municipality of Silicote official plan and zoning bylaw amendment. The purpose of the application is to permit a multiple residential apartment building within the existing hotel building on the subject property. The effect of the applications are to permit a total of 86 residential apartment units within the building. The proposed development is a part of the rapid housing initiative under CMHC, which aims to create new affordable housing. The subject lands are located within the highway commercial designation of the official plan and are located within the highway commercial zone in the zoning bylaw. Residential uses are currently not permitted within the highway commercial designation or the CH zone, and therefore the application are being submitted to permit the proposed use on the subject lands. A site-specific CH zone is being sought to include residential and highway commercial uses. The applicants also have submitted a consent application to legally separate the existing sunset in building from the remaining subject lands and buildings, hotel and restaurant. The planning coordinator will confirm how notice was served to advertise this public meeting. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, notice was circulated to internal staff and external bodies by email. Notice was also advertised in the Sioux Bulletin and on the municipal website and social media, sent by mail to property owners within 120 meters of the subject property, as well as various agencies, and signs were posted at the property entrance. Thank you. The planning coordinator will provide a summary of the application. Thank you, Mayor Lawrence. An application for zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment was submitted by Fusion Capital Corporation on behalf of Sunset in Inn Incorporated for the subject property located at 10 First Avenue South, known locally as the Sunset Inn. The purpose of the application is to convert the existing hotel building on the subject property into a residential apartment building. The proposed project is part of the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation's Rapid Housing Initiative funding stream. 86 residential dwelling units are proposed within the existing building. Currently, the building contains 70 rooms. The applicant is proposing to construct a small addition on the south end of the building where the existing pool is located, which will be modified to contain additional dwelling units. The proposed dwelling units range in size from about 300 square foot studio apartments to approximately 1,000 square foot two bedroom apartments. The official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, uh, amendments are required because the subject property is located in the highway commercial designation of the official plan and the highway commercial zone in the zoning bylaw, neither of which per permit residential uses. The subject property also contains a second hotel building and a restaurant along with the hotel building that is proposed to be converted. The applicant is proposing to legally divide the existing buildings on the subject property through a consent application. The consent ac application will take into consideration access and easements over the subject property. The subject property and proposed re residential apartment building is subject to a site plan control agreement to deal with other detailed design aspects of the project, including but not limited to parking, buffering of the uses from adjacent lots, landscaping, and other items. The proposed redevelopment will provide high density residential development within an existing service building, specifically affordable house housing units managed by the Kenora District Services Board. It is staff's understanding that the affordable units will meet the definition of affordable housing units found in the official plan, and so contribute to the stock of affordable housing in the municipality, as well as to the stated targets within the municipality's planning document. Comments have been received both in favor of the applications and in opposition. Comments in opposition related to land use include concerns about parking, road access, and servicing. Each of these concerns will be addressed in detail during the site plan control application phase that the applicant will need to undertake if the applications are approved. But based on the site plans provided, the development will exceed the required number of parking spaces for the proposed apartment building. The existing road access and servicing will be assessed during the site plan control application and improvements will be required where necessary. 
Comments in favor of the application generally note that the development would provide needed housing for the town and creates a foundation for improvement in other areas of life. Staff are recommending the official plan amendment be adopted and the zoning bylaw amendment be passed as the proposed residential apartment building is consistent with the PPS. The intensity of the proposed use is similar to that of the hotel that currently exists on the subject property. The proposed redevelopment contributes to the housing stock of the municipality by providing additional affordable housing opportunities. In this case, the short and long-term housing opportunity provi provided by the proposed apartment building outweighs the importance of the planned function of the area for commercial uses. The proposed residential uses are in the public, in public interest of the community and are compatible with the surrounding land uses. Thank you. The planning coordinator will read out any correspondence received from government agencies and municipal staff. Here are you, Mayor Lawrence. The Ministry of Transportation did provide comment on the applications. The proposed is a zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment that would allow an 86 unit multifamily residential apartment building within an existing hotel building on the subject property as part of the rapid housing initiative under CMHC. The subject property is located on the north side of Highway 72, known as the Ed Ariano Bypass, Sunset Inn property, 10 First Avenue. The Ministry of Transportation does not object to the proposed zoning bylaw and official plan amendment. The ministry wishes to provide comments for the future consent application for the proposed development of the subject property. The owner applicant will need to comply with Public Transportation and Highway Improvement Act. MTO offers the following information about the PTHIA. The PTHIA requires MTO building and land use permits to be obtained for any development or construction occurring within 45 meters of the property limit of Highway 72 and within 100 meters. 180 meters of the center point of the intersection between the highway and a public side road. The subject property is within the permit area. The permit requirement is for construction and installation of any structures above or below ground, fences, grading of land or drainage alteration, installation of entrances on side road, etc. The ministry will require the submission of a full traffic study to be completed. The PTHIA requires sign permits to be obtained for any signs located on the subject property and are visible to a provincial highway and within 400 meters of the property limit. All permits are required prior to any development or construction taking place. MTO permits are in addition to the municipal building permit requirement. And that was all. Thank you. The Applicant or representative, sorry, the planning coordinator will read out any correspondence received from members of the public. For you, Mayor Lawrence, two comments were received from members of the public. The first is from Patricia Spice and Stan Dixon, and it reads as follows. Good day. I received a letter regarding the proposal to convert the Sunset Inn into an 86-unit residential housing property. I have a number of issues and concerns with this proposal. Firstly, is the corporation funding this project a fully Canadian owned company and will income from the project remain in Canada? It is a private corporation, so how will the rent control be implemented to ensure it meets with affordable housing initiatives under the CMHC program? All too often, these units end up run down and become slum housing units at higher than affordable rates. Will they ensure adequate parking for 86 units? Will the roadway leading to the cemetery be repaved and maintained to handle the increased flow of traffic to that corner? Will there be fencing around the property to ensure children do not run out into the Ed Ariana Parkway? Will the town reduce the current speed to adjust for children in the area? Will the town install a four-way stop at the corner to allow for pedestrians to cross to access the park and information center? Increased affordable housing, low income housing to the area will require additional police services who will pay that cost. Increased housing units to the area will require additional school and bus staffing to accommodate children of the 86 families that would reside within the units. Will property owners that are adjacent to this low income housing unit be property tax compensated for the additional noise with disruptions, police presence and garbage and waste that will be thrown out onto properties and the threat to our home values and the increased foot and vehicle traffic this will cause. The Sunset Inn has always had a reputation of being run down and experiencing a high demand of the community's police services. Creating 86 affordable residential units will certainly increase police presence in the area. 
I personally believe the town will be on the hook to pay for a lot of additional services to enhance the sewage requirements, traffic and roads to ensure that it can be safely used by families residing in the proposed housing. I say nay to the proposed change and feel that a new housing complex with upgraded building standards from the ground up be built not an old outdated building retrofitted as an excuse as a cash grab under the guise of creating fast low income housing and passing the tax burden on to the citizens who look out. Recently, there were posts on Facebook from people saying staying at the hotel that showed how the windows leaked water, water leakage creates mold, during the storm of June 2021. The building is already a substandard and not maintained and to allow it to, allow it to be a quick retrofit to house families is just wrong. We personally feel this is simply a way for this corporation to attempt to turn the hotel into a profit maker after purchasing the failing and rundown business, which to date they have invested little money to update. Regards, Patricia Spice and Dan Dixon. Sorry, Dan Dixon, pardon me. The second comment received was from Lizzie Barris. Uh, I am a resident of Sioux Lookout for the last four years. I am a lawyer by training and currently work as a policy analyst at SLIFNA. I wish to make some comments in support of this application, which comments represent my personal opinion and may not re reflect the views or opinions of my employer. We desperately need more housing options, including affordable housing in Sioux Lookout. Many organizations are unable to fill positions due to candidates being unable to find housing, from entry level positions to highly trained professionals. Furthermore, affordable housing is an essential foundation to any other efforts being made to address other social, economic, and health issues. I would also like to point out that the residents would need some way to, stop, to safely cross the highway, perhaps a traffic light or a pedestrian bridge. Thank you for considering my comments. Best wishes, Lizzie Barris. And those are all the comments received. Thank you. Thank you. The applicant or a representative is invited to speak to the application. Is there a representative hi. or the applicant? <clears throat> yes, hi, Ross Ransby from Fusion Capital Corporation on behalf of uh, Sunset Inns, uh, Peter Patel, who's going to join us as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, councillors, administration staff. Um, thank you for leading Sioux Local Municipality. We are very delighted to be able to be able to actually make this application for the OPA and zoning amendment and subsequently consent applications for the Sunset Inn uh, for the property. Our applications are on behalf of uh, the Sioux Lookout, uh, Sioux Lookout Friendship Accord, which is jointly com uh, comprised of four First Nations communities surrounding Sioux Lookout, Slate Falls, Cat Lake, Black Sewell, and KI. Fusion Cap Corporation is acting on behalf of the, as agent and developer for SFLA. We have made it our applications to CMHC, the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation for the Rapid Housing Initiative 2.0 for a fully uh, funded contribution for affordable housing projects such as this. The CMHC fund, which is 2.0, has allocated another 1.5 billion for affordable housing in Canada. The strong need and affordable housing for Sioux Lookout area has never been greater than now. Northwest Ontario, is in dire needs of all types of housing. This project would consist of a completed renovation, complete renovation of Sunset Inn, 86 furnished units with focus on Indigenous, Indigenous women and children, seniors, etc. We have four, we'll have 14 units designated as accessible for clients with mobility issues. The facility is designed as a nonprofit using rent geared to income model using the Canadian housing benefit on housing, sorry, Canadian Ontario housing benefit model, which provides a portable benefit committed to the person, not the unit. C, uh, KDSB will come in as the property manager to manage and lease up the facility once it's all done. Um, some of the concerns that were brought up with security, et cetera, uh, we've, we've, we, we dealt with that during our, our planning stage. Uh, we have a very sophisticated uh, camera system, security system, and as well, um, right now, the Sunset Inn is currently monitored by police services and we've encouraged them to continue monitoring it going forward. Um, should we be successful being awarded this funding for this project, KDSB would be actually just running the entire thing as asset managers as well. 
KDSB is a service provider for Ontario Works Social Housing, Emergency Medical Services, and Early Learning and Child Services, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. Um, KDSB gave us some stats um, in July that there was 306 people urgently waiting housing in Sioux Lookout. This would help alleviate some of that waiting list. We've also provided the planning department uh, with all our consulting studies to support this application. It was our belief that the zoning from the highway commercial, as it is right now an operating hotel to residential will in fact reduce the overall vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic to and from the site. As the facility will be more focused on permanent housing, not nightly stays. We are optimistic that CMHC funding will get through for this project and the rezoning hopefully will come to fruition after today. Thank you. And if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. That's, um, that concludes the, the applicant's presentation, I think. So we'll move on to questions from members of council. Council. I'll start with Councillor Lego. Yeah, uh, this is a question for staff. Um, I believe there should have been a traffic study done for the work that's going to be done, I believe, next year on Wellington Street. Um, was the traffic study done for that project? Um, uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, I wish Andrew Jewell was still here, but, uh, but I believe through the process of designing the Wellington uh, First Ave intersection, I believe that was part of that process, but Michelle might be able to speak to that as well. Um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I was just going to comment uh, the same as Jody, but we will follow up and advise council. Okay. Yeah, it just seems that uh, there is going to be a lot going on there, but uh, I, I think this is a, is a good thing and a step in the right direction to uh, serve our community and a lot of people that need affordable housing in our community. So I'm, I'm on board with this. Thanks, uh, Councillor Lego. Uh, I can't comment on the housing, on the traffic study, but I know we would have done a traffic study when, because the, the uh, for the uh, intersection, the Wellington in intersection and the turning circle, I'm sure, am I wrong? Anyway, they, that project has been approved, the turning circle and the upgrades to the intersection. It was just, we have postponed it a year because of, we thought the upgrades finally did start at, at the overpass. Uh, the MTO overpass. We didn't want to have both both entries into town uh, on one single lane traffic at the same time. But that upgrade is CAO. Uh, we're going to proceed with that, I hope, in next July. Is that correct? Uh, correct. We're looking to tender it out over the winter months to start construction in July because the uh, bypass uh, work with MTO is supposed to be completed towards the end of June 2022. Thanks. Council, any further uh, questions or comments? Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, definitely we, we need um, these units. Um, have a couple of concerns, and um, I think we have to be very careful that we're not just out there creating units and creating beds. And uh, if we look back at when the Ontario Housing first started to, um, to uh, build uh, subsidized housing, they put people in far out places like the Norwick or um, Macintosh, whatever, totally unsuited to the population. And I think we have to be very, very careful to make sure that this project fits with the population, which means we're gonna have a lot of children. There's gonna be a lot of children, disabled people, etc. We have to have something like a playground right on site. It's not good enough that kids are going to be dashing across the road. They've got to have a place. They've got to have a place to play there. There has to be common areas. There has to be a way in which um, the the um, the project can become a community. That's one of the issues that we are need to look at very closely here in terms of fast housing development. We cannot lose the community. Once we lose the community sense, we've got high, we've got uh, uh, crime rates, um, vandalism. And that to me is really, really essential. We're talking about putting 86 families uh, together. Very, and that's, that's very rapid for our 
our town. I don't think we've created 86 new houses in maybe 10 years, I don't know. The other thing is too, is should there not be three bedroom uh, units? Because two bed, most of the people are gonna be, have children, um, probably more than one child. And um, two bedrooms, is that gonna really cut it? I guess that question would be for uh, Mr. Patel. We'll, we'll direct it to the uh, to the applicant and whoever is, the designator is their representative to answer that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll take I'll take that. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, yeah, actually, playground was one of the first things we have. We've got it. I don't know if it's on stuff that was provided to uh, the planning department uh, yet, but there's a 2,000 square foot playground that's going to be on site. Um, so that hopefully deals with that. We actually have quite a bit of common areas inside the facility um, and lots of like a lot of amenities too. So it will create that community as you speak about, which I appreciate. Unfortunately, for the three bedrooms, we couldn't, um, we couldn't get any three bedrooms to fit inside of the, the framework that we had. And it was more, um, we, we were provided a lot of information to, from KDSB on the breakdowns of the on the waiting list. So out of 306 on the waiting list, only 8% were for three bedroom and more for two bedroom and for single room occupancy. And that was the majority of the of, of what was on the waiting list. And that's what we were really focusing on. And I appreciate your comments, but we were looking at really what KDSB was providing us when we designed the building and the layouts. Okay, thank you. I'm glad. I'm very glad to hear that you're. There's going to be common areas, green spaces, picnic areas, all sorts of things like that. That's very good. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you for the presentation, and I, I, I do agree with both Councillor Lego and Timson. This is a, a step in the right direction. I also echo Councillor Timson's concerns as well about the community. So, the common spaces that you speak of are those just outside? Or are those indoors as well? Uh, so indoors, we've got a we've got a, a, a gym that was going to be there. We've got two meeting rooms and a workshop, um, I guess, and then some would be on the outside as well. But we were really trying to create a lot of units. But we do have these common rooms and as well this um, workshop room, which we were told that by KDSB that was something that might be required as well. And it was something that CMHC suggested as well. Okay. I hope that answers um, your question. Yeah, it does. I'm just I'm just looking at the actual blueprints right now, and it does. I, I see the workshop area, and it's quite small considering to the in proportion compared to the entire development. Um, I don't know if plans have changed or not. It just it does seem, and I understand the need to get the amount of housing in there and try and maximize the housing. Um, I, th I think it might be something worthwhile looking down the road is some more indoor common areas because uh, as you know, it's it's winter, you get winter for almost eight months of the year here. And sure. indoor common areas will go a lot further, I think, than, uh, than the outdoor, um, you'll get more use. Um, I guess I, 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 I think it's a good utilization overall though of the space and what's there. I don't know what the occupancy of the hotel has been going forward there with uh, in the lead up and how that would change actually based on the occupancy to fully occupied at the 86 units. Can you, are you able to speak to that? Yeah, I think, uh, well, the idea would be that the SFLA would purchase the entire site, that entire building, and then <laughs> renovate from right down to the bones of it and renovate it and and, be, and get the 86 units, we can modify it to get more indoor common space if that's, you know, if that's your wishes to, to get that done as well. I can't speak of the overall occupancy rate uh, of the existing facility the way it is right now as a hotel. I'm sure Mr. Patel could probably give us some insight on that. Yes, uh, I can comment on that. Uh, Pre-COVID, the occupancies were between 75 to 80%. Uh, as soon as COVID set in, it dropped down dramatically. And almost the last fiscal year, I would say our occupancies dropped by 50%. Uh, 
in the last three, four months, we're seeing a strong comeback almost to pre-COVID levels. So, you know, so that's regarding the occupancy. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm just I'm just looking at that and referencing that the comparables as outlined in the report that the the 70 units is comparable to the 86. So if you're operating at 86 or 80 percent occupancy, yes, 86 versus 50. Yeah, sorry, uh, historically, there's been a lot of push to create more hotel rooms in the community. So, you know, um, and there are a few projects uh, being developed where newer facilities, newer hotels with conference centers are being talked about in which myself as an hotelier will be participating in that development. Yeah, just uh, to add a little awesome. further, those are these are going to be permanent dwellings, so they're not night, nightly stays as hotels. So these will be units where we'll have leases with tenants, um, and KDSB will run it. So it's not nightly stays. So there wouldn't be an occupancy sort of level. It would be more of we're going to have a vacancy issue if we have any, and I don't assume we'll have any. We just given the strong demand for housing up there, so um, it'll be a permanent housing solution. No, I, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Council. Any further questions? Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I wonder if um, uh, Mr. Ransby, if you, if you might be able to clarify something. I'm not good at this kind of thing. Um, I don't quite get how you have 70, you have 70 rooms, uh, hotel rooms, but we're going to make 86 uh, units uh, which in each unit, the two bedrooms are going to be larger than the existing hotel room. I don't quite get that. <laughs> Maybe it's you a, can explain that to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Uh, right now, um, I don't know if you're familiar or too familiar with the site, but where there was the old pool inside the facility, there's nothing in there. It's just vacant. So that's what we're proposing to knock off and rebuild that section because it just wouldn't work for us. And so that'll be able to give us the you know, the additional 16 units on that wing, let's just call it, that is presently um, just filling, filled with air. Just to add to that, that's uh, 6,000 square feet of empty space. Okay, so like would one, would one two bedroom apartment be sort of the equivalent of two hotel rooms or three hotel rooms or how would that work? Um, well, we've we've taken um, two uh, two some in some cases um, we've taken two hotel rooms, made them one one unit, and been able to reorientate it to get a two bedroom or one bedroom there. Uh, but mostly those are just one bedrooms, and then the single room occupancies, and then the two bedrooms, etc., are all down in the new wing where we've had where we'll put up those new facilities, and that will that's where we'll get the two bedrooms. And those will be the accessible units as well because it'd be a lot easier to build them as accessible rather than convert existing um, units. Okay, thank you. There is a an elevator there, isn't there? Is yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the old uh, workout gym. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the new wing will have a new elevator just for that end of it because we've got mm -hmm. some building code issues that we'll have to, you know, have put in with uh, firewalls. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Council? CAO. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, just hot off, hot off the press, uh, we can confirm that a traffic impact study was done at the uh, intersection of Wellington and First Avenue. Thank you. Anything further, Council? I see nothing, so we'll move on. Oh, sorry, Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, and, and and does that study show that it could handle this this uh, increase in uh, traffic? I haven't read the the whole thing because it's 104 pages. But what it did was it took into consideration the increased traffic uh, proposed by the Hillcrest development, which is a, would be a lot of traffic going in and out of uh, 
First Avenue. So uh, I imagine that it would be able to handle an extra 86 uh, uh, units uh, that people would have vehicles or pedestrian traffic as well. Thank you. Nothing else from council. I'll go to the next item is members of the public are invited to speak to the application. The public can ask questions of clarification or seek background information, speak in support of the application or speak in opposition to the application. All questions will be directed through the chair. It is requested that only one question be asked at a time. Please identify yourself before you ask your question so that you can be properly recorded in the minutes of the meeting. Are there any members of the public present who wish to speak? Yes, uh, Jake Doxater here. Oh, sorry, Mayor Lawrence, you're muted. Yeah, the host muted me. I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, I'm off mute. Thanks. Uh, did I did my last? Did that that came through? Yes. So, Jacob Doxater, go ahead, please. Uh, hi there, my name is Jacob Dockstad. I'm the executive director of the Silicon Friendship Accord Economic Development Corporation, which represents the communities of uh, Slate Falls, Cat Lake, Lac Sewell, and KI. Uh, through this application to the Rapid Housing Initiative, we will become the ultimate owners of the uh, proposed development at Sunset Inn. And uh, this is a you know very historic, I think, development for these communities and an important step uh, in our mission to sort of bring these all communities together, including the municipality of Sioux Lookout. That uh, speaks to the efforts of the municipality, uh, Doug Lawrence, Mayor Doug Lawrence, and his uh, great commitment to Indigenous people. And uh, I just want to express my support for this application, the hard work of uh, Mr. Patel and Mr. Ransby as well. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? Hearing none. I'll move on to the conclusion and closing of the public meeting. This concludes the public meeting regarding the official plan amendment number OP04-2021 and zoning bylaw amendment number Z09-2021. If any member of the public wishes to be notified of the decision of council in respect of the application, you must make a written request to the planning coordinator. Notice to appeal the decisions of council to the Ontario Land Tribunal must be filed with the planning coordinator no later than 20 days from the date of notice of decision is circulated. The notice of, to appeal shall be sent to the attention of the planning coordinator, and it must include the following information. The notice of appeal shall be sent to the attention of the planning coordinator, sorry, and it must include the following information. The reasons for the appeal and the fee as prescribed under the Ontario Tribunal, Land Tribunal Act in the amount of $1,100 payable to, by certified check to the Minister of Finance, Province of Ontario. Only individuals, corporations, or public bodies may appeal the decision of council to the Ontario Land Tribunal. An appeal may not be filed by an unincorporated association or group. A notice of appeal may be filed in the name of an individual who is a member of the association or group. So we have two options. If there are no opposing comments raised at the October 20th, 21 statutory public meeting. Clerk, I look for your assistance here. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, <clears throat> The uh, option two um, is if there are comments that cannot be addressed at the meeting. Um, my recollection from um, uh, the planning coordinator's uh, presentation is that uh, most of the um, items that were addressed uh, in the one letter um, can be um, addressed through either the consent application or and or through site plan control. Um, if I'm correct on, on that, um, I believe I am, I see nodding, um, then um, if those items can be addressed that way, then council can still proceed if, if it wishes. However, if it would prefer to have those items addressed in the subsequent uh, report to council, that's also council's option. All right, thank you. And the planning coordinator has confirmed that the items can be or have been addressed. Yes, thank you. So I will go with option one and council can decide whether to support it. And if it's uh, not supported, then I will go to option two. So option one, that council receives the planning report dated October 20th, 21, respecting official plan amendment number OP04-2021 and zoning bylaw amendment number Z09-2021. And further, that council authorizes the adoption of official plan amendment number four and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 99-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 84-18, 
being a bylaw to adopt an official plan for the corporation of the municipality of Sulacoat as amended, 10 First Avenue South, and further, that Council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 98-21, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 85-18, being a comprehensive zoning bylaw for the corporation of the municipality of Sulacoat, 10 First Avenue South, as amended. And that's that. We will ask for a mover for that. Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Bath. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Confirmatory bylaw. And that actually will do the confirmatory bylaw now for the statutory public meeting clerk. The bylaw number 101-21 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacote, October 20th, 2021 statutory public meeting, be read a first, second, and third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Howey, seconded by Councillor Fanlin. All in favor? Carried. And that brings us to the adjournment of the statutory public meeting. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Jacob, Ross, Peter, and other visitors who were here. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to the regular council meeting, October 20th, 2021. And I will call the meeting to order at 6.15 PM. Asking for amendments to the agenda, Clerk. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, in light of the statutory public meeting, um, council, I believe, will wish to add the following items uh, to the agenda. Uh, so the first uh, would be um, the addition, um, so it would be item 7.6, uh, Zoning Bylaw Amendment number Z08-2021, uh, Voyagers North Road East. Uh, then there would be item 7.7, 7, uh, Official Plan Amendment uh, Application number OP04-2021 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment uh, number Z09-2021, um, that's respecting the uh, Sunset Inn uh, applications. Uh, and then additionally, under uh, item number 10, uh, bylaws, uh, we uh, Council may wish to add bylaws uh, number 9721, 9821, and 9921 as they really relate uh, to the planning um, matters that were discussed at the statutory public meeting. Thanks, Clerk. Um... And I will rely on you as we get to those sections of the agenda to, to uh, remind me and help me through those. Thank you. So uh, a motion to confirm the agenda uh, as amended for the October 20th, 2021 council meeting. Moved by. Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Fanlin. All in favor? Carried. Declarations of pecuniary interest. A few, Mayor Lawrence, I have none for the open session. None for, thank you. Adoption of minutes, that the minutes of the public hearing and regular council meeting held on September 15th, 2021, and the minutes of the special council meetings held on August 23rd, 2021, and August 24th, 2021, be approved as presented. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Fanlin. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Motion to receive minutes from outside agencies and boards. That the August 26, 2021 Kenora Home for the Aged meeting minutes and the August 27, 21 and June 28, 2021 Northwestern Health Unit Board of Health meeting minutes be received. Moved by. Councillor Fanlin, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. And before I call the numbers, uh, Clerk, um, do we need to lift 76 and 77 or not? Uh, only if council wishes to discuss them. First. Okay, it doesn't, they don't have to, thank you. So I'll start with 7.1, Municipal Drinking Water and Sewer System Financial Plan. Councillor Cassidy. 7.2, NOHFC phase two application, Umferville, Trail Rec Umferville Recreation Trail reconstruction. 
Three, notice of motion recognition of Pioneer Cemetery west of the Iron Bridge in the municipality of Silicon official plan. Councillor Fanlin. Item 7.4, Rural Ontario Municipal Association Board of Directors, Zone 10 vacancy. Item 7.5, 2021 Ward Boundary Review and Recommendation. Councillor Timpson. And 7.6, zoning bylaw amendment related to the Terry application. And 7.7, 7, the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments related to the, I'll call it the Sunset Inn application. Thank you. So what I see that we have lifted um, is, 7173.75. So a motion to adopt the items not requiring separate discussion, item 7.2, 7.4, 7.6, and 7.7. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Fanelin. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And now we reach delegations, presentations, committee presentations. So we have two tonight, two delegations. The first is MPW Incorporated MNR property presentation. And the presenters are, they're still with us. Yes, Daryl Morgan, Jamie Wisnowski, and Alan Pizio. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. The screen is yours, let's put it that way. Um, I'll try and put up a display here. Thank you, uh, Mayor Lawrence, Council and uh, administration members of the public. What we wanted to do today, can you hear me okay, Mayor Lawrence? Yeah. Uh, we just wanted to provide some information for the project that we're working on. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as the MNR Diaper Alley property. I think you're all aware of it. Um, we've been working with uh, administration over the last couple of years. There's been lots of work done, but we're, we're finally getting to the step where things are moving along you know, in a uh, much better process for us and we're able to share this uh, publicly. So we wanted to share with you our plans for the property and how things are playing out. Um, I did send a, I think I sent a PDF, uh, a, a brochure pamphlet to you. I'm not too sure if you got it. I can put it up on the screen. Uh, So the property in question is the former Diaper Alley property on the MNR property, which is being surplus by the MNR and put up for sale. We applied as a group, uh, myself, Jamie, and Alan, to purchase the property for the development of condo units at the site. Um, this is the vision that we've had. There's been lots of talk about it within the municipality, and we, we decided that we would take on the project to to do something that we feel would be a great addition to the municipality, uh, provide housing for, uh, unlike unlike what uh, the fusion capital project is, which is affordable housing, this may be one step above that, uh, but provide some quality luxury and uh, uh, condominium development living in the municipality, which is highly needed for, for everybody involved. Um, on the lake shore, it's given us uh, access to the waterfront. Uh, the plan would be to have some docking space available. We're looking at building the units in the phase uh, project so that we would have three different developments that would take place on the site. So three different buildings, looking at 16 units per building. Um, looking at good size units, 1,200 square feet is sort of average. Uh, that we're looking at. We would have uh, indoor underground parking with it as well. Um, and this is a bit of a display of the land that we're looking at. So I'd like to thank uh, the planning department and your economic development people in the CAO who has worked with us through this process with the MNR. 
uh, to get to the point where we are here today. Uh, as you can see, we're looking at three different buildings on the site. Um, and we would do it in a phased approach so that, you know, we, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves and make sure that everything goes. Uh, the public consultation that we've done to date has given a resounding uh, support for the project um, from everybody that we've talked to, neighbors, residents in the area, and just the general public. Um, working with Kuwait Maskey here locally in town, we've done this conceptual drawing of the proposed development and the layout. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of finalizing the, the, the site plan. Uh, with the municipality, and I think we're going to have a meeting next week with uh, the town plan um, to, to help us get to the next step here as well. So the property of interest you can see on the right hand side of this uh, uh, screenshot, uh, it's been developed previously where it says property of interest. That's where all the houses were in there previously. And everybody locally or some of the old families referred to that as Denver Alley. So, uh, some people have come to us and said, oh, you're buying the beach, uh, you know, you can't develop the beach, you know, it's going to be closed to the public. We don't own the beach. The town owns the beach already. That, that's the municipality's property. And the property that we're looking at is the old diaper alley. It's highlighted in, in red. What is missing off this one diagram, and it's part of the process and part of the dialogue that we've had with the MNR and with the municipality is that uh, on that triangular piece, that's where the existing access is to the beach property that isn't really legal access, but people use it to get to the beach, uh, to use the, the municipal beach in that area. We would be granting an easement across that piece of property to, to provide parking and uh, access to the beach. So there would be a designated easement that would go across that. That was a requirement for the municipality as well as community and national resources uh, to proceed with the project to get to the state for that. So just to clarify, you know, there's rumors that we will own the beach. We don't, that's yours. We will provide a legal access that gives everybody access to the beach and that would get turned over to the municipality in the process. So that's yours. The parking lot would be there and uh, access to the beach. So just to clarify that one thing. Um, I should have maybe started off with introductions of ourselves. I think most of the council knows myself, Alan, and Jamie. Uh, I, I think we have a, a pretty solid track record of business development and uh, good business operations. And we got together as, as three of us with the intention of developing this as a bit of a legacy that would continue on within the municipality and build something that's quality and is going to continue to be to come and give other people access to have late short of the within the municipality. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Uh, you know, we want to have something quality where we still have a lot of work to do, but the, the word is out on the street and we thought it was important to, to inform council of where this project is going because it is a big project. Uh, it will be a, a huge addition to the municipality. Uh, and if we're looking at putting in three buildings or 60 units per building, that, that's a fair chunk of uh, real estate that goes up in the municipality. And of course, that means tax dollars for, for the town tax base. So I think it's positive in that way. What makes this project very attractive for us is the fact that we can buy in this municipal sewer and water system that was extended to the MR property. Uh, it comes across. I still call it Fort Drive, but I'm not too sure what the southern access is off Highway 72 to the uh, Fort Drive, but the sewer and water is right there. So we can come down the right away, right into the property, and service this project with municipal sewer and water. So that, that's that's one of the key things that we need to attract for us. So thank you for putting that sewer and water in there when we did that you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so yeah, it's about 200 meter extension that we've got to run the sewer and water from where it currently terminates into our property. So um, that's sort of everything I had to say. It was really just an information thing. We do have a lot of work to do. 
our expectation as far as timelines. Uh, we're going through an environmental assessment. You may have seen that piece in the paper that the MNR is asking for comments. Um, you know, one of our key things that we want to do with the property is try and maintain the current aesthetic to the property in terms of the trees and the landscape and stuff like that, and work our construction within that uh, the confines of that site sits today. Uh, a couple of comments we've heard from people. Well, it's always going to go in and clear cut, clear cut the property, uh, cut down all the trees. That's not what we're going to do. That's not what we want to do. Uh, we want to maintain as much tree landscape as we can to protect privacy of the site from the highway for noise buffering, as well as the neighbors. Uh, so, um, we've had conversations with the neighbors to the south. So, we're cognizant of some of their concerns as well. The nice thing about this property is that it's already zoned properly to accommodate this development. We don't have to go through a zoning uh, amendment or anything. So there's a few hurdles that we have to, to jump through, and there's going to be work that we need to do with the town planning department uh, in conjunction with the planner and the uh, CEO. Uh, you know, there will be the, a need for a traffic study, and we've already had a discussion with the MPO and the committee asking on that. And, you know, some of the things that they're looking at is where the access would be off the highway, and, and they're, they're wanting the access right on the corner that they can get clear lines of sight both directions, uh, north and south. Uh, but that, that'll get confirmed in a traffic study by, by us when we do that for them. So there, there's still hurdles to come through, but we're hoping that next summer we can get to the point where we're doing some of the civil work on the site. Uh, we'd like to say that we could start development next year of the actual building, but that might be a little bit aggressive. Uh, but definitely in 2023 is when we would see stuff moving forward on this program. Um, municipality has been very supportive of this through the protest, and we thank you for that. And uh, we just wanted to take 10 minutes here and share a little bit of the information of where we're at and uh, the next steps of what we try to do. And that clears up some of the ambiguity of. The rumor mill and the coffee shop talk about what's going on. Here. So, uh, thank you. Any questions? I thought you just added, Daryl, uh, this should this should help with retention of seniors with Sue Lookout. Um, it's um, you know, very um, low maintenance for uh, for the uh, people that own the condominiums. This would be a, a condo association taking care of maintenance, as well as uh, you know, any um, uh, professional people coming to town uh, looking for a place that. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, very, uh, very hassle free to live in. So I think that's something that uh, Sula Club doesn't have right now, and it uh, should help uh, help with uh, those two uh, uh, parts of demographics of our population. And just for clarity on that part of the thing, thank you. But uh, this is a condo development, so it will be owned by the residents. It's not a rental unit uh, development. Uh, so I think by having it, Owned by the residents that will be living there, you know, they're going to take pride in, in their space and the grounds and everything else. So I, I think it's going to be a great development to hold out for the community for retention of, of professionals and seniors and just general people like myself. I don't consider myself a senior yet, but I'm probably going to want to live there too. So. Any questions from, from council? All right, thanks, uh, uh, Daryl. But can we go back to full screen, uh, please, so I can see the uh, the council? There we go. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. And, uh, very appreciated. Council, comments, questions? Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I had a little difficulty hearing you, um, and I I wasn't able to read the um, presentation beforehand. Um, I, but again, the same question that I asked earlier with the um, project going in on uh, sunset is the creation of and maintaining of community in this uh, in this project that you're proposing, which sounds very very nice, very interesting. Um, Common rooms in the in the buildings, green space. Yes, you're going to have that, but just a, a way in which people will connect 
with each other and maintain that sense of community? Well, the common space is designed into the four of the building. Like even, you know, common, um, common kitchens where people could have a, you know, a building potluck and that kind of thing. I think these are really, really important. And as I said before, we're developing, we're going to be developing so fast that we have to think more in terms, more than just beds, more than just rooms to live in, but a place to call home. So, and a place that it says, this is a permanent place, lots of storage for it lots of storage for people you know not not a not a place that really just says you're here for one year and then they are so and, and that's the whole idea of yeah. this is, it's a it's a home it's not just a transitional housing or something yeah if you want a condo that's your home and that's where you're going to live and you know there may be some people that are seasonal residents where they want to live here in the summer and go south for the winter that mm -hmm. allows them to have that opportunity to do that kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. You can walk away from it and you're not worried about being in a yard or a home or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what's after by the condo corporation and, and the mm -hmm. owners. And, and that's their home and that's the way they come mm -hmm. out of town. Um, Thank you. Other council? Councilor Cassidy. I just want to say thank, thanks uh, for the presentation um, and, and the group that, that's come forward here. I, I, I've seen this, been out to this property many times and I think it's one of the nicest pieces of property in Sioux Lookout and that's, that's ready for development or to be redeveloped, I guess, as it already was developed. Um, and I just want to say thanks to the group and, and thanks for clearing up uh, any of the, uh, the rumor mill there and keeping the access open to the beach and maintaining that as a public space. So well, it's, it's great to see um, a lot of development developments proposed and moving forward tonight. So I look forward to watching this one go, go forward as well. So thank you. Councilor Bath. Yeah, thanks guys. That's a, uh, it's a pretty impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm most so uh, enthusiastic. It's nice to see local folks doing this. We've been talking about housing since I moved here and uh and not having enough and it's always somebody else should come and do it so it's great to see the you know a group like you guys coming together so it's been a pretty exciting evening actually for what's happening in housing uh, I, i'm fully supportive of what you guys are up to so good work councillor lego yeah uh, again uh, reiterate from the other councillors uh thank you very much for stepping forward and doing this it's uh, another thing that's needed in our community uh, and it's greatly appreciated uh, just one question. Uh, I know some people have been asking about uh, the snowmobile trail that comes up from Second Sandy Beach and then across. And I'm not sure if that's your property or not, but that was a lot of people's access from uh, Pelican Lake to Abram Lake and then on to Minnetaki. I just wonder if that's going to be left or if that's been discussed by you guys. So the, the, the official trail for OPPA that exists today would have access to the lake and through the easement that would be created to access that feature. So it would be a, a continuation and I guess that would be up to the municipality to say, yeah, you can use it or no, you can't, but the easement is there and then uh, it would be up to you to determine how you grant that such and don't grant that such. In our mind, that's a logical step. The trail's there already. Um, so that's not going to change. The trail that is unofficial that comes across from Second Sandy across the highway and across, that's not an official trail. And unfortunately, that access will probably disappear. That's, that's not part of the OPP trail system. It's not signed, it's not marked, and uh, it's actually not safe by where they come out there because they're, they're around the one side of the corner, and your line of sight is, is way off there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just wanted uh, some people were asking about that and want some clarification. So I appreciate that. And I talked to uh, the president of the snowmobile club, uh, Dean Osmond. I talked to him and, and discussed this with him as well. And the fact that there will actually be a, a legal easement put in place that grants access to the water tank uh, on the road from, from the highway. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Council, any further comments or questions? Councilor Howie. Yeah, I just wanted to express my support for this. I think especially for young professionals coming to Sulaco, it might uh, reduce the burden of uh, having housing as an issue when you think about recruitment and retention. So this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I see no further comments. I just uh, echo all of council's comments and uh, we need housing right across the spectrum. And this this is certainly part of that spectrum and really, really excited to see it uh, underway and going in and uh, the, local, the local impetus behind it is great. Thank you. So unless there's anything else, we'll close off this delegation and say, thank you, gentlemen. And we'll move on to our second delegation, Municipal Drinking Water and Sewer System Presentation. Presenters are Peter Payne, Financial Consultant, PSD Citywide, and Mitchell Woolley, Financial Software Analyst, PSD Citywide. And you are with us, yes. The screen is yours, gentlemen. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, this is the... Thanks, this is the very first time that we've done the a water and sewer financial plan to council. We've taken, um, staff has taken notes over the last two financial plans that we've presented to council. And we felt that this year would have been a great year to do a presentation. We've been working with PSD since May, originally started with the public works manager and myself. And um, we've been working with them um, and meeting with them roughly every two weeks uh, since roughly the beginning of May in order to get this financial plan together. We've hopefully made it um, easier for council staff and the public to understand it. That was the main focus um, with this plan this time around from the last two that I've been involved with. Um, a lot of notes that came back were from the fact that it was a little bit hard to understand. Um, it didn't quite flow properly. It didn't explain certain things and everything else. So we took all those notes and uh, we did a whole redesign of the financial plan for this year. And we're hoping that um, this financial plan makes it a lot easier for everybody to understand. So tonight's presentation um, is about how we came up with those numbers, what we looked at, different scenarios that we took into consideration, all the projects, stuff that we know is and is not coming down from the government as of right now, and um, all those thoughts and ideas and future plans have all been placed into this project. So that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to Peter and uh, they will start the presentation. Thank you so much through the mayor, Lawrence. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mitch, to get started here and then I'll jump in. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you for the introduction of PSD Citywide, Carly. Uh, my name is Mitchell Woolley, and my colleague Peter Payne and I are pleased to have been invited to do a presentation for the Sioux Lookout Water and Wastewater Financial Plan for 2021 to 2031 with an accompanying rate study. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to quickly just take the opportunity to say thank you to Sioux Lookout Treasurer Carly Collins, as well as former Public Works Manager Andrew Jewell for their respective support during the building of this report. As Carly mentioned, uh, bi-weekly meetings for about the last four or five months. And as we go through this presentation, uh, I think it should be noted that this financial plan, while a legislative requirement, we've built it in such a way that Sioux Lookout can use the detailed working papers as a foundation for future year budget implementation. Uh, the agenda for our presentation as follows, Peter Payne will be providing an overview of the associated legislation and PSAB compliance before getting into the details of the financial plans for the water and wastewater systems. Once Peter finishes up going through those financial plans, I'll give a summary on the recommended rate approach for the financial plans. And with that, I'll turn things over to Peter Payne. Thank you so much, Mitchell. So 
one, before I just jump in with the associated legislation, uh, which could be boring at some at some points, I just want to point out that this financial plan, which Carly alluded to, was really drafted in a fashion that we took a high level detail of all the assets um, and all the expen expenses and revenues coming down the line to really build a, a foundation so that your municipality could use this in the ongoing budgeting um, implementations for the future. So real quickly, I'm gonna talk briefly about the legislation. The Ministry of Environment um, has set out legislation, legislative requirements for local governments in renewing their water license. So this financial plan and this report for Sioux Lookout, um, it fulfills all those requirements specifically outlined in the um, Safe Drinking Water Act, as well um, as the, it fulfills all the regulations under the Ontario Regulation 45307, which further details what should and should not be included in the financial plan and the requirements for approval. Um, further to that, while the Sustainable Water and Sewage System Act has not reached royal assent, it was still considered within this financial plan and should give Sioux Lookout um, a great foundation going forward. Similarly, um, looking forward to Ontario Regulation 55817, the financial plan considers future requirements um, that define a process where all asset, asset management planning must tie to the financial plans. Jumping to um, the public sector, sector accounting standards, I wanna provide the mayor, council and the public confidence that this financial plan is presented in compliance with the CPA public sector handbook. So there's two real um, sections of the handbook I wanna to touch, touch on. One real quickly is section 12, 1200. The pro forma financial statements or the forecasting financial statements within the report are based on a full accru accrual accounting basis. So not to bore you with too much details, I'll, I'll try to simplify that. What that really means is the statements recognize revenues and expenses in the same period the activity pay takes place rather than when cash transactions take place. The TCA accounting treatment prescribed under um, section 3150 and are capitalized to ensure that the assets owned are recorded and to account for the ability to provide future benefits. So, Sue so Lookout's TCA inventory presented this financial plan meets this compliance. The asset inventory represented on the financial statements is calculated using historical costs less the accumulated amortization, which really means the use of the asset to arrive at the net book value which is presented in the financial statements. So with that being said, I'm gonna jump into the financial plan, starting with the water. Um, there's two important um, things I wanna mention before we jump in. One, that the financial statements here are not audited and include estimates and assumptions. So as you go through the, as Sue Lookout continues with their budgeting process, and more information becomes available, the assumptions and estimates should be refined in future years in conjunction with their budgeting process. We'll start with the statement of financial position here for the water. The statement of financial position is often used as one of the indicators for the overall financial health of the municipalities, um, for the financial health of the municipality. It provides a snapshot where the systems stand financially with respect to the assets it holds, um, as well as the debt it owes at a particular point in time. And lastly, it gives you a shot uh, a, a, in the moment of time, it gives you a screenshot of where, um, what assets you hold under TCA, which we'll discuss further in the slides coming up. Now, when we look at the net financial assets and debt, this is calculated by taking the financial assets and less the liabilities. The, a net financial asset position occurs when the assets are greater than the liabilities, implying that the system has 
implying that the utility system has the resources to finance future operations. Conversely, a net debt position implies the system's future revenues must finance past transactions as well as future operations. I really want to, I'm going to say this a couple of times through the presentation, just to be clear. The lack of senior government funding will have the biggest impact on the net financial position for your utilities. I want to ensure uh, the council as well as, as as the residents that future capital needs have also been determined and summarized with this plan. So we took it in, into account your current assets and your future projects and your future investments are considered in this plan. Jumping into the details, when we look at the forecasted financial assets, Throughout the financial plan for water, we see a growth from 1.8 million in 2022 or 2020, rather, to 4.6 million in 2031. So that's a good news story. Also, we see the liabilities remain fairly consistent at 2.3 million in 2020, all the way through to 2031, with a peak, which aligns with your investment um, in infrastructure in 2023 at 3.7 million. Now, when we look at the non-financial assets, which is your tangible capital assets, um, which is your infrastructure for the most part, um, we could see that in 2020, they total 11.3 million. And then it finishes in 2031 at a projected 11.4 million. I wanna really reiterate, I wanna reiterate what this graph illustrates. It really shows the investment that council has already decided to make in the infrastructure from now all the way through to 2025. The decline from 2025 to 2031 represents the annual amortization or the current use of the asset infrastructure, the infrastructure assets. Another important, important point here is that the annual infrastructure investment for water and your wastewater, which we'll talk about shortly, exceeds the, um, the investment Exceed, including the reserve, uh, the reserve contribution, exceed the annual amortization expense. So what this does is the strategy ensures that, ensures that current rate payers are comp contributing the minimum use of the tangible assets while also investing in future demands. Moving along to the uh, statement of operations. This statement summarizes the revenues and expenses generated by the water and, waste, and wastewater systems for a, a given period of time. The, uh, when you take the revenues less the expenses, you get the annual surplus and deficit, which really measures the revenues generated and confirms whether the revenues generated are sufficient to cover expenses incurred, and in turn, whether financial assets have been maintained or depleted. Now, when we look at the surplus before other, I want you, I want to make it clear, this represents the budgeted contribution to the utility reserve going forward, which I'll highlight in the next couple of slides here. The total amount transferred will be 3.65 million to the utility reserve uh, in regards to water over the 10 year period. Now, when we talk about the, I'm sorry, when we look at the year over year increase in the revenue collected, it represents the minimum requirement outlined in the financial plan. The impact is an annual increase of 3.8% um, each year. And this will be discussed more in the rate section. So in 2020, when we look at these details, you see that the revenues for the water system totaled 1.7 in 2020, and they're expected to grow to 2.3 million in 2031, using the steady increase of 3.8% on the rates. When we look at the, the, expense, the expenses, a large portion of that relates to Northern Waterworks Inc, or NWI, which Sulokot has a long-term contract with. 
So that provides confidence in forecasting the expenses. Other expenses include um, the interest expense related to debt, amortization, and the municipal salaries and benefits. The water system expenses are expected to grow from the 2020 number of 1.6 over the next decade to 1.9. Lastly, I wanna look at the water reserve or the utility reserve balance for water specifically. The financial plan includes a budgeted transfer to reserve throughout the next 10 years of 3.65 million or an average of 365,000 a year. Now there's fluctuations year to year. This is an average amount, and this is based on a gradual rate increase approach, which will be discussed when we look at the rates. Switching over to the financial plan for the wastewater. Again, we're gonna look at the statement of financial position and we're gonna look at the financial assets and the debt, which when we take the assets less the debt, you'll see that it, grow, it actually declines into a net debt position. So what that implies is the system's future revenues, again, must finance past transactions as well as future operations. In this case, the net debt position is a reflection of the municipality's um, uh, guidance to uh, expand the infrastructure expansion. An example of this would be the wastewater treatment plant. And again, to reiterate, the lack of senior government funding will have a significant impact. If Sue Luckout is able to obtain senior government funding, this will make a significant, will have a significant benefit on the statement of financial position. Now you'll notice as debt is increased, you'll see your tangible capital assets and your infrastructure value increase as well. So this is really a good news story. Diving into the detail, what you could see here is the, the financial assets being mostly your reserve will increase um, about $2 million throughout the life of the 10 year plan. When we take a look at the liabilities, it grows from 1.48 million in 2020, significantly to 8.7 million in 2031. Again, this is indicative of the municipality's prioritization of the wastewater infrastructure and increase, increasing the investment on that really from 2023 onward. Which you could see here as the infrastructure grows from 8.8 .8 million all the way up to 15.6. And this really highlights the, the municipality's strategy to expand this infrastructure rather than just replace it. And it really uh, illustrates the investment again, starting in 2023 all the way up to 2026. When we look at the wastewater statement of operation, um, again, when we look at the reserves, it's going to increase. And in line with that, the expenses will increase. The annual uh, year over year increase will be again, four and a half percent. Um, and represents, again, when we look at the surplus before other line, represents a contribution to the utility reserve. And similar to the water system, the infrastructure investment, including the reserve contribution in the financial plan, exceed the annual amortization expense. And again, this ensures that current ratepayers are contributing equitably to the minimum use of the assets while investing in future demands. So when we look at the revenues, we can see an increase from 1.3 million all the way up to 1.9 in 2031. Along with that, the expenses grow from about 1 million in 2020 all the way up to 1.8 million in 2031. Similar to the water system, Nor Northern Waterworks Inc. and WI has a long-term contract for the maintenance, which allows for confidence in this forecasting. And similar other expenses will include debt interest, amortization, and municipal salaries and benefits. Lastly, when we look at the reserves, 
The commitment in this financial plan includes two million or two hundred thousand dollars on average per year from 2022 through 2031. And again, the fluctuations from year over year in the reserve transfer amounts are based on a gradual rate increase approach, which again will be discussed next in a recommended rate section. For that, I'll turn it over to Mitch. Thank you, Peter. Uh, as we get into the recommended water rate increases for the financial plan, it's important for us to summarize the methodology we use to determine what rate increases would be required over the life of the financial plan. And this really involves four major steps in building out the future year expense amounts. First, we looked at the annual operating growth requirements through the life of the financial plan, which as previously mentioned, is largely driven by Sioux Lookout's operational contract with NWI. Next, we looked at the investment in reserve growth through the life of the financial plan, which was largely developed through discussions with uh, the treasurer, Carly Collins. Third, we built out the changes in debt payments through the life of the financial plan, which is driven largely by investment in very tangible capital assets. Lastly, we considered forecasted future year use of existing assets, as well as the impacts resulting from investment in future tangible capital assets, the current year future impacts from those investments. The strategy we're recommending for this financial plan is a smooth rate increase approach. And what that means is with the 2031 finance or pardon me, the forecasted 2031 financial statement of financial position, a consistent rate increase annually in the financial plan was found to be about 3.6% rate increase in 2022, and then a 3.8% rate increase per year for the remainder of the financial plan. The benefits of the financial plan's smooth rate approach are consistent and predictable annual rate increases for users, affordable and sustainable rate increases throughout the plan, flexibility for change to actual rates through the 11 years should, for example, senior government funding be obtained for infrastructure investment. And finally, and maybe the most important piece is current and future rate payers would be contributing an equitable amount to annual operations the use of assets, and as well, the investment in capital assets. And at this point, we'd just like to highlight that if a smooth rate approach was not taken for this plan, the required rate increases in the short term would have been unsustainable, with, as you can see, a 14.5% rate increase being required for 2022, 3.9% in 2023, and 3% in 2024, before leveling off to a marginal rate increases in the remaining years. These options both achieve the same ending balances at the end of the financial plan, but the smooth rate approach is the recommended strategy for the benefits that I have mentioned. And as we move on to the wastewater system, we use the same logic when we were looking at building out future year expense requirements, which was again, the uh, impacts of annual operating requirement growth, investment in reserve growth, changes in debt payments, and forecasted future year use of existing assets, as well as impacts resulting from future investment in TCA. With the smooth rate approach, the plan recommends a 4.6% rate increase in 2022, followed by 4.5% rate increases in the remaining years per year. Once again, if a smooth rate approach was not taken for this plan, the required rate increases for the wastewater plan would have seen large spikes in the years where major capital investment and debt issuance takes place. For example, the expansion of the wastewater treatment plant and as illustrated, the plan would have seen large rate increases of 12.9% in 2022, 12.2% in 2025, and 22.1% in 2027, with marginal rate increases spread throughout the other years of the plan. Now, the bottom line impact to Sioux Lookout's typical water 
and wastewater consumer is that they would see their combined annual consumption-based bill increasing by approximately $60 in 2022 under this financial plan with similar increases in the remaining years uh, on top of that. Now, as mentioned previously, these recommendations in the financial plan consider many assumptions. And as a result, these assumptions need to be refined as more information becomes available in future years in conjunction with the annual budgeting process. As this brings us to the end of the presentation, I'll pass things back to Peter for some closing comments. Yeah, thank you, Mitch. At this time, I just wanna uh, again reiterate my thanks to Mayor Lawrence Council and all the staff, especially Carly in um, putting this plan together. Uh, as she mentioned, it was a five, five month process where we looked at every detail um, capital project going forward and we looked at all the operating costs as well. Um, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Carly and, and so she can provide closing remarks and we'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and um, Mitchell. Hopefully during this presentation, we were able to answer some of the council's questions in regards to how we were able to put the plan together and everything else. Um, does the council or mayor have any questions in regards to the presentation or the plan itself? Thank you very much, uh, Treasurer and uh, uh, Peter and uh, Mitchell. Council, questions, comments? Councillor Bath. Probably more of a comment than a question. Uh, Carly probably remembers that she's smiling quite brightly here about my last comments on the last plan. It was uh, I, probably more like rantings that went on for a long time. And uh, I, we finally thought we wanted, if this is what, what those rantings uh, uh, achieved, then they were worthwhile. So thanks for that, Carly. Anything further, Council? Uh, Councilor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter and Mitchell. I think this is uh, this kind of report um, is exactly I think what we we really need at this time with a lot of the big uh, capital projects on the horizon. Uh, and Carly, thank you as well for your work on this too. This is this is really good. Um, I, one question for you guys, um, as kind of experts on this, is it common practice in other municipalities or other areas you areas you've worked that the metered um, the metered water your sewer rate that you pay for is based off your metered water rate? Is that fairly common practice across the board? I would say yes, it's based on consumption a lot of the time. Um, Mitchell has been an expert. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, both Mitchell and I have over a decade experience working in particular local governments. So I'll turn it over to Mitch if he has anything to add to that. But yes, it is very common. I think Peter had summarized that perfectly. Um, prior to PSD Citywide, I worked for a municipality doing billing for uh, their water wastewater, stormwater systems. And it is a very common practice uh, across Canada that wastewater uh, charges are based on a consumer's water consumption, metered water consumption. Okay, thank you. Um, just follow up question for that. So outlined in your report, we have principle seven that says ensuring users pay for services that they are provided leads to equitable outcomes and can improve conservation. In general, metering and the use of rates can help ensure users pay for the services they're received. So I guess the question and where I'm going on that one is, is how does that account for people that say water their gardens, fill their pools, that may not take advantage of utilizing the sewer rates that the metered water, they're paying for that metered water, but it's not actually going down their drain and treated. Um, has that question come up to you guys before, or do you have any any comments to add on that or insight? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'm going to turn it over again to Mitch here fairly fairly soon. There's been different approaches in different municipalities on how you how they do this. So we were not engaged to do a high level um, um, review of changing the rates 
or changing the structure of the rates between different meters amounts. But I've, I've seen it in past municipalities, and I believe the one that I worked at in the past, where the sewer rate was cut in half based on uh, the summer months. And maybe Mitch, maybe you could clarify that. Yes, Peter, that is correct. That That is one strategy that municipalities sometimes take is to reduce sewer rates during summer months to account for seasonal water use to kind of prevent that non-equitable charge of, you know, when you're watering your garden, obviously that water is not impacting the wastewater system at all. Thank you very much for your insight, gentlemen. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I have a question. Um, several times you alluded to uh, if senior government provides funding, is the model and and the uh, the smooth rate increases based on assuming that capital projects are fully funded by the municipality? Correct. So, what the plan? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Going throughout, uh, looking at the capital investments with Carly. We substantially used debt for the projects we knew. And then um, I can't remember the year specifically, I'd have to look back at my notes, but we attributed $100,000 a year per utility from the reserve to fund current year infrastructure investments as well. So you're correct in that assumption. It's debt and some reserve transfers in the financial plan. So now, I guess this, oh, sorry. My apologies, um, Mary Lawrence. The projects that you have on the go currently that did uh, that have included grant funding or um, government transfers have been recognized as a revenue source in here. So I believe there's one project and I would refer to Carly to speak to it if, if you have further questions. Sure, and I guess the follow up is um, maybe it's to Carly. Are there projects in, in the, these assumptions that are, are shown as fully funded by the municipality by various means that we would normally anticipate getting assistance from senior government on? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Lawrence. So what we looked at and was all the projects that have currently been presented to council for approval for either design and engineer um, and everything else. What we've also, what I also did was I reached out to other municipalities to see if they've heard of any sort of government funding coming down the pipe for infrastructure such as this. Um, and so far, no one has heard anything. So we took that into um, consideration on a lot of our large projects that we know we currently don't have any funding for and that most likely we would need to take um, 80 to 100% um, of a long-term debt for those projects. But those lengths of the payments were also taken into consideration. Okay, I, I guess um, just to be more direct, it, it, we will apply for government funding on some of these or they're not, and, and we may get it. Get some yeah, help. So as, as of right now, there is no government funding out for any sort of linear infrastructure at the moment. Um, if funding becomes available, yes, of course, we will apply for those fundings for all of our projects for as many as we can in order to get government funding for everything that we are trying to push forward. So I, I look at projects we've completed uh, in the recent years, whether it be Gang Street, where we did linear infrastructure, is that uh, the road, sewer, water, uh, storm water, and as an example, and we've done um, some on Wellington, et cetera. We applied for it. I mean, OKIF, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, yeah. would, would be an example. You're saying that this model does not include any fund, any such funding. That's correct, because as of right now, there's no funding available for municipalities to apply for. A lot of the funding that is coming out at the time is for uh, arena improvements, facility improvements, for um, um, health and wellness, um, those types of projects at the moment. Right now, there's currently nothing available for um, these types of projects. 
so I know it fluctuates from time to time, year to year and government to government, but it is unusual that we have a drought of government funding for infrastructure for more than two or three years. There's usually some infrastructure program that comes along. So I, I guess I'm trying to, pre this would seem to me to be a worst case for a smooth rate increase. And, that and that's, what the, that's fine, I, I, I like that approach, but I would anticipate that we would get some government funding for at least one or two of the projects that are in this list over the years and, and that smooth rate increase could decrease. That is correct and that's our hope. Thanks, uh, Treasurer. Uh, uh, Councillor Lego. Yes. Um, at uh, what point uh, during a project um, will we be no longer be able to get, if there's, say, government funding comes up and it's we're at almost 90% complete, can we still apply for funding? Like, is there a cutoff? It, like, or if the fund, or if the project's completely done? And we went to our, our taxpayers and went, we have to fund all this. And then all of a sudden after we're done the project, we, the funding comes up. Through you, Mary Lawrence, unfortunately, no, we can't apply for funding on projects that have already been uh, completed. Um, I've seen it with the municipality before where we've started uh, design work and engineer work on a project and funding has become available and we've applied and we were approved um, prior to construction commencing. Um, but I do not believe that once a project has started construction that you can apply for funding. That would, we would have to look into that if that were to uh, come up. But I don't believe so that that's even possible. And how long can we delay the new CTU project at the, the wastewater plant? <laughs> Waiting on funding. I'd have to defer that uh, question to the CAO in hopes that she could answer that. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, our first, our first round, we were denied funding. There was funding for a uh, program for funding for it. We're hopeful, we're, we're anticipating given a municipal election next year that there will be funding coming out because that usually it's quite lucrative in an election year. So we're, we're praying that there will be something that we can reapply for that CTU unit. Thank you. Anything further, Council? Councilor Cassidy. Um, yeah, just a further question with regards to kind of, I guess more the tail end of this is, how do we account for, I guess, is there um, a certain percentage or an averaging that you used for the tail end of this report to maybe account for projects that we might not know about and how those would be factored in or would that have to come across the, the total, the net increase or, or the, the, uh, the increase in the asset at the end of it? Hope I'm phrasing that right. If did you, we, we planned for the known projects, but was there anything taken into account to just generally budget for unknown projects going forward? Um, I guess I'll answer this. Uh, yeah, so there's a, we, we definitely budgeted for the known projects going forward that were approved. And now we, this was very, I wanna make this uh, very clear. This financial plan was drafted in a way that as more information comes clear, it's easily adaptable for Carly. So there's all sorts of, um, lead sheets and documentation in the background to adjust this. So when you have more information on future requirements for projects and you have more certainty around funding, it will have an absolute impact on your rates. However, um, to answer your question specifically um, through the mayor here, the, the tail end of this financial plan includes contributions from your reserve for each utility upwards of $100,000 a year. So whether you use that or not, now that's, you know, I, I would anticipate two or three down, years down the road, you might have some growth and that might need to be amended. Perfect, thank you. That was my follow-up question was regarding using this formula or this plan going forward. So thank you for that, that's great. Anything further, Council? I see nothing. So, um, Treasurer, did you want to sum up or? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I would just like to uh, 
uh, thank Peter and Mitchell for um, all their hard work towards this uh, financial plan and for uh, taking their time this evening to help um, present it to council. And I echo that. Thanks, Treasurer. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, Council. We'll move on then to staff reports. And the first one is uh, municipal drinking water and sewer system financial plan. So we have a motion that Council receives and approves the water and sewer system financial plan as prepared by the Treasurer dated October 2021. And further, that the financial plan be submitted to the Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing in accordance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And further, that staff publish notice of the availability of the financial plan as prescribed by Ontario Regulation 453-07 in the local newspaper and on the municipality's website. Moved by. Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Lego. Discussion starting with Councillor Cassidy. I guess I got my pipes crossed on this one and I, I lifted this, but my question actually came out in presentation, so it was answered. So I am uh, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Uh, anybody else have questions or comments? Councillor Lego. Yeah, um, just uh, in regards to rate the rate increases. Um, Will those be brought to council each year as the, as the gentlemen were saying that new information may come up and we may not have to do a 3.6%, we may get some funding? Or are you looking, or are staff looking later on when you, when you bring this back to us, looking at a two to four year plan where we're gonna go, it's gonna be 3.6 or 2.6 or whatever we end up deciding upon? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, there's a couple of different options that Council can decide on how they would like to direct staff to approach this. Um, uh, we can bring a report to Council, knowing most likely what the 2022 rates would uh, need to be. And then from every year after, they could be reassessed based on how projects are moving forward in regards to any sort of additional funding that may be added towards a project any sort of additional reserve or, or items that may occur with it, or even the fact that projects may come under budget, we don't know. Um, so that direction uh, can come to staff from council as to how they would like to proceed with the rate structure. Just if you're, look, if you're looking for a longer period, sometimes uh, it's hard to take back once things are already approved by government, um, that we we're going to go with three point six percent, and all of a sudden something else comes up, and it could be dropped. But a lot of times it's hard hard to uh, get government to change their mind once they already have revenues coming in. So that was one of my concerns. Um, one of the other things um, I guess we'll have to deliberate is how much as a council do we want to be putting into reserves every year? Because I see at the end, we're looking at like $423,000 in a surplus for, I don't know if that's water or wastewater. Um, for me, I, I, I would like to sort of know what percentage do we need to start at to break even? And then we could discuss what we want to see as money coming in for surplus. Um, I know that in 2022, there was a $92,000 or 2020, there was a $92,000 surplus. Um, for me, I don't, I don't know if we need to be taking in $400,000 a year in, in surplus. Um, you know, it's supposed to be user pay, not user overpay. So. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. I'd like to just do a quick comment on that. In um, the next couple of years, the municipality is gonna be responsible for submitting a financial sustainability plan um, towards the government. This is part of us becoming sustainable. And part of that plan is gonna to need to include that the municipality is putting enough money away into reserves to help with uh, current infrastructure that's gonna to need to be replaced. 
one of the big issues that's coming down right now for municipalities is that the government wants to see it so that municipalities are putting enough money away into a reserve fund in order to be sustainable so that they're not relying so much on long-term debt or the fact that they'll be needing funding from the government in order to move projects forward. This helps us put us in a better uh, financial sustainability for our water and sewer system. Okay. So money that's going into reserves for water, can that money, or and wa wastewater, that money can only be used at those plants? For any sort of water and sewer infrastructure upgrade. Okay, that's good to know as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And my other questions were already answered in the other. Uh, uh, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I had uh, one more question. Probably should have asked it during the presentation. But how how can you deal with the, the conservation, the need, the need to conserve the water? Um, for example, the person who uses the minimal amount of water, they end up paying $90 a month anyways, even if they use nothing. Um, there's no incentive to really not use a lot of water <laughs> uh, at that level. Uh, and I'm thinking of people who live alone, seniors and so on. Um, 3.8 percent increase every year is is really going to be hard on a lot of people and particularly people that aren't using water that much who don't mow, uh, who don't water their their grass who don't have a pool don't flush the toilet every time um, you know um, I think there has to be something in there that that takes that takes that into account if, if you really want people to not use a lot and to save the infrastructure, then there has to be something built in. Treasurer, may I ask a question uh, on top of Councillor Timpson's there or to augment it perhaps? Is the, the and maybe this came out and I missed it, is the 3.8 or 3.6% increase, is it on the user, is it on the consumption part or on the total bill? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, it's on the total bill. Thank you, okay. Did you have any comment for Councillor Timpson or? Um... Oh, yeah. So currently, how the water and sewer rates were laid out um, prior to how it is now is every user was billed for a flat fee of consumption rate. Um, the municipality received a lot of complaints at the time in regards to the fact that people that only had a two people that live in the house or one person that lived in an apartment that they were paying too much in regards to their water bill. They uh, felt like they wouldn't use 10 cubic meters a month and they didn't want to be billed for that. So from that staff at the time did a restructuring, which was approved by council so that there was a flat fee that went on everybody's bill. And then everyone was billed by uh, consumption. So whether you are a single person that lives um, in a home, you are gonna use less water than, and you are gonna be billed less um, than somebody who has a household of four and they have a pool in their backyard and everything else. So we are trying to um, keep it simple for the customers and um, so that the customers really only pay for what they use. Councillor Timpson? Would that not mean that you, you would need to uh, lower the lower lower the bottom rate? You know, the, the, the least the least consumption rate. I think it's now $90, but why not lower the number of cubic meters and lower the the rate? And that will get people that will incentive give incentive to people to use less water. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, we could, but then we would have to increase the rates because we still need the revenue to come in in order to pay for the future infrastructure and the current infrastructure that we're currently paying for to even just operate in general. 
But you I want to extend that. the life of the infrastructure as well. So that, you know, the more it's used, the faster it's going to deteriorate. So I believe the CAO has a comment to make as well. I just yeah. want through you, Mayor Lawrence, I just wanted to add, it's not only uh, future needs for in, or current needs for infrastructure, it's the ongoing operations of, of the, our water distribution system and, uh, and our uh, sewer system, as well as the plants that operate them. So those costs are ongoing. And um, of course, every year they increase. So uh, we have to keep up with that demand um, for those costs to make sure that we're at least covering our current expenditures as well. Yeah, the in, in many ways the sewer and water um, is like the electricity bill you have a you have a base portion to your electricity bill and then a consumption portion and your base portion is uh, you are charged whether you use one kilowatt hour or or ten thousand kilowatt hours the base is the same some of the costs that we incur i think as a municipality are base costs and and you can even if you take a trickle of water or you take a lot of water we still have to have a water treatment plant with x number of staff and meet x standards we have to have a wastewater plant uh, we have to have uh, distribution piping and fire hydrants that, that provides fire protection and fire protection through the water system is part of the water system and the costs we incur um, i'm just thinking about the the uh, the reserve that you're putting aside is how we in in is so we have an extremely cold winter and we have a a, a a water pipe break. I think we had that actually um, in the last few winters. We've had one or two of those, and and I, it would cost tens of thousands of dollars to get that fixed. How is that allowed for? Is that from reserve, or how do we allow for that? So through you, Mayor Lawrence. In the past, what we've done is. Uh, depending on how big the problem is in regards to it in the past, we've taken the funds from the reserve in order to pay for it. If we found that certain areas were under budget within the operating um, budget, then it was placed into there. So different projects we've had um, different scenarios with, I believe one year we had one that was just down the street from the municipality and we took it from the reserve because the project was uh, quite a bit larger than what we anticipated it. So we had uh, council's permission to uh, take those funds uh, completely from the reserves. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Yeah, so we had an, an increase last year to water and wastewater. Uh, this year. This year. And when was the last year we had one before this? Never. So, so before that, it wasn't until October of 2015 when the last increase had occurred. So seven, six, seven years. Okay, all right. It's good to know it's we're playing, we're paying, or playing catch up now. Councillor Bath is nodding his head. Yes. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else, Council, for uh, Treasurer Councillor Bath? Yeah, that's just one of the, that actually hit it right on the nose where I wanted to go earlier is that, it, that I think it, it's essential that we have a long range plan that shows uh, increases annually. Uh, I've been yelling for increases, I think since I got on council and this is, and just to finally see it happening is, is uh, I don't like it, especially now that I'm gonna move to town, I really don't like it, but uh, it, it's, it has to happen. So I think it's it's good to see it, and I, I wouldn't like to see us sort of nitpick it and tear it apart and then change it every year. We need to be locked in that probably it's going to be three point eight percent per year for you to be sustainable. And uh, and I think this is the comments that, that that Charlie just made about we had we didn't win, we did the last twenty fifteen I think. Like obviously we weren't sustainable then. So good work. Anything further, Council? All right, then I will, we have a, this uh, motion on the table. I will call the vote on the municipal drinking water and sewer system financial plan. All in favor? Carried. Thanks, Treasurer. Item 7.3, notice of motion recognition of Pioneer Cemetery, west of Iron Bridge in the Municipality of Silicon official plan. The council directs staff to undertake an update to the Municipality of Silicon official plan to recognize the cultural heritage feature known locally as the Pioneer Cemetery, located west of the CN Iron Bridge. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Lego. Discussion starting with Councillor Fenlon. Yeah, 
Yes, uh, we have concrete information that there's actually people buried there and who they are, or is it just, were you just going on somebody that seen something years ago back there, back down on the west side of the bridge there? Yeah. CIO, who my okay, uh, clerk, thank you. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, yes, uh, Councillor Fenlon, there, um, there is confirmation of uh, interred uh, human remains there. Um, we don't necessarily know um, who they are, but we know for a fact that there are human remains uh, buried at that location. Okay, fair enough. Anything, any further comments, questions? Councillor Bath. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of, you know, of maintaining the historical uh, areas like this. And, you know, it's a shame we're losing a lot of them. We're changing names and tearing things down. And this is, this is great in this way. The only one concern or, or question I have is, is once we recognize this, does it make it a cemetery or potentially make it a cemetery that the municipality would be responsible for? That's the only question. I've Clerk. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, no, this would be uh, simply a recognition in the in the official plan uh, as the area of, uh, as having significant um, uh, a cultural um, feature uh, in the official plan. Um, you know, there isn't a direct correlation between uh, updates to the official plan and the bereavement authority of Ontario, which regulates the uh, the sector. Um, you know, there. I think what we need to worry about a little bit more is the um, uh, the cemetery in Hudson uh, and that one becoming um, our um, responsibility. Um, I think that's uh, a much more uh, likely uh, uh, to occur, and I, I do foresee that coming in, in uh, the next couple of years. Any further comments on the Pioneer Cemetery Council? Seeing none, then uh, I'll say thanks to Councillor Cassidy for bringing this forward and call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 7.5, 2021 Ward Boundary Review and Recommendation. The Council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 103-21 being a bylaw to dissolve Ward 1 Hudson, the only remaining ward within the municipality of Sulacout, effective for the 2022 general municipal election. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Bath. And the comments will start with Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do. Uh, I do agree that I don't see I don't see a, a value in there being a war, award uh, for Hudson. I do um, sympathize with the comments, though, that it is a fairly unique place and has some specific needs. And I would like to see that there be some sort of um, recognition. I guess it would be in our procedure bylaw about committees that there will be a Hudson advisory committee that will deal with Hudson issues. I think we would accomplish the same thing if we uh, continued to have a separate uh, committee for Hudson or possibly even a, a committee for all the rurals, like could be the rural, rural municipality committee or something like that, but something that uh, is specific, a committee that's specific to the needs. Council, comments, questions? Councillor Howie. Uh, I, I too appreciate uh, the feedback that was from the, from the public and also do uh, echo Councillor Tinton's comments. I think, you know, the, the input of, of those in the, in the rural areas of Sulacote is valuable. Um, however, I, I also um, do think we, we do need to do away with the ward uh, system. Thank you. Councillor Fanlon. I don't, I don't agree with it. I think it's, um, it was put there by Commissioner Gray for, for the residents of, uh, of Hudson at a time when uh, they didn't want anything to do with annexation. And uh, that was sort of uh, 
a little carrot for people in Hudson to, uh, to give up what they, what they had previously to that. And um, uh, I don't, the, the board was made for the residents of Hudson, not for the residents of Sulaco. So was this um, uh, questionnaire that was sent out, was it sent out to all the residents in Sulaco and Hudson? Or was it just sent to Sulaco, to Hudson? So that's a question. I mean, it's up to, it's up to the residents of, of Hudson if they want the board or not, according to uh, what, I, what I think uh, uh, Commissioner Gray put down. The clerk, you wanted to answer a question? Yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes. So uh, the survey was available to all residents of the municipality because the electoral system in the municipality impacts all residents, not just the residents of Hudson. Uh, so whether a, a council wishes to maintain a ward system or wishes to move to a fully at-large system um, it does impact uh, all the residents. Uh, additionally, um, Commissioner Gray in his restructuring order uh, actually acknowledged that the creation of both the Sulagout and Hudson Ward uh, were intended to be temporary. Uh, he has quoted in, in uh, or an excerpt from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the final restructuring order actually said that uh, he didn't see the long-term wisdom of, ret of retaining those mm -hmm. words. Um, so that was part of, uh, of uh, the restructuring order as well. Uh, and ultimately, uh, under the Municipal Act, it's uh, uh, the, the, uh, the electoral system is up to council, whether it's a ward or, um, or an at-large system. Um, so um, that, that ultimately is council's decision. Thank you. Council, anything further? Councilor Cassidy. Um, I, I do agree that I think it is time to move away from it. Um, I, I don't think I've heard in my duration on council here, I have heard anyone be dismissive or not inclusive of acknowledging Hudson and them as a part of this, of the municipality of Sulacout. Um, Hudson's a part of Sulacout, Sulacout's a part of Hudson. The histories are intertwined. There's so much connection between our two communities. We, we are one and I think this needs to be acknowledged. Um, it, it needs to go forward now. It has been 24 years. Um, I, think, I, I think there's enough rationale for it. When you look at representation right now, there are, based on the amount of voters we have, I believe it's one councillor one of the five councillors for 550 voters in Sioux Lookout, and Hudson has one councillor that represents less than 200 people. Um, I, I believe in representation across the board. I think this is something we should look for, look look at and, and move forward with. So I would support it, but I don't, by me supporting this in no way means that I'm thinking less of Hudson. I, I think it's time that we move for all councillors for all parts of Sioux Lookout. Um, as Councillor Timpson alluded to as well, like where do we, what else do we look at? There's there's significant rural areas around Sioux Lookout. Do we need, do we need councillors out there, and do we need some for Alcona? Like where where do we draw the line here? I think it's it's all, we should go all in on this, and it's Sioux Lookout. Hudson's a part of it, and let's just go with that. So. Thank you. I'll just make a couple of comments myself. If I'm, uh, and I'll come back. I. I think of the, um, the municipality as a community and it's a community of multiple communities. Uh, we could say the geographic areas, Hudson, Alcona, South Shore, former Drayton, the urban core, whatever. Uh, and then within that, there's, there's even sub communities. It's also a community of, of gender. There's a community of, of males, females, and a community of, that, that are LGBTQ. Each is, is a community in a sense. Um, does, does each community get to have a representative? No, I, I, we get elected to represent the entire community and everybody in it, whether they're a homeowner or, or a renter, whether they, they use the emergency shelter or they, they live in the most expensive facility or they just own land here. 
they're all part of the community and we represent them all, each and every counselor. A counselor, to my mind, represents all the, all the people. It represents the community as a whole and, and we act in the best interests of the community as a whole. Um, so I, I'm in support of moving on to, to eliminate the Hudson Ward. I'm supportive of the, 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 the recommendation the staff have put forward. Um, back to the council table. I saw Councillor Fanlin and I think Councillor yeah. Timpson. Yeah. Councillor Fanlin first. Sorry, Councillor Fanlin, I, I interrupted. You're muted now. Yeah, that's Thanks. fine. Um, I agree with what you're saying, but it, there's been no accomplishments by uh, this council or previous councils to address, well, with the exception of one when we bought the land did the surveys and bought the land of, for, that was set aside for Hudson um, to deal with, to have. There's been no, um, nothing actually done in Hudson comparable to what's happening in Sulaco. And, and that, that's a long time. I mean, we can go back to the 80s and we have had um, uh, six lots sitting up here behind uh, Bernier Crescent that has not been dealt with by any council to, to put, them, put them into uh, um, operations. So there's not, there's not the same amount of, of uh, spending or whatever you want to, uh, given to Hudson. That's okay. it for me, I guess. Okay, I would, uh, I'll have to, just from my own observation, I see uh, there was a new water treatment plant constructed in Hudson at the cost of several million dollars. Uh, I know we paved a, a significant portion of road in Hudson last year, and every year there's, there's roads paved. To say that there's nothing being accomplished, I think is is more than a stretch. I think it's it's uh, it's not good information. Things have been accomplished, but if, if you're saying there's nothing, if you say nothing's been accomplished and we've had a, a war representative for, for all those years, then perhaps it's, it's not meaningful to have a war representative. Maybe it would be better to try the other way. Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, I mean, I think that there's a lot of potential for future development in Hudson. It seems to be the only place where there's land. And I, I think it's worthwhile to um, put in this resolution, uh, and, and I'd like to propose a, a, an amendment to the resolution that um, the Hudson, Hudson Advisory Committee would, would continue to um, look at the future of Hudson, something along those lines. Because I, I think it is an important area. Uh, and, it, but, and, and I think we can get as much done and possibly more if we continue, you know, get the entire council involved in Hudson. Everybody is involved in Hudson. Right now, you know, you feel that you're sort of a bit of hands off because it's a ward. You don't want to interfere in in the in the ward business, but this way it would be everybody's. And so I would like to suggest a, a, a an addition to the resolution that a, um, a Hudson Advisory Committee be a regular committee of council. Clerk, uh, um, did you want to make a comment? A few, Mayor Lawrence, yes. Um, uh, council also uh, instructed uh, staff to undertake a review of all of its uh, committees this year. And uh, that report uh, actually will be coming next month to council. And uh, respectfully, I would recommend that any decision on any committees, including the Hudson and Area Advisory Committee be um, uh, be set aside for that uh, discussion uh, with the review of committees. Does council not decide on a, on a year to ba year basis or is it term to term basis, which committees to have? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, it's uh, entirely at council's uh, discretion uh, when it chooses to review its committee structure. It is uh, done every term, uh, but um, uh, it's specifically, uh, I was instructed uh, this year to do a review of all the boards and committees and, and bring forward recommendations to council. Um, and and uh, so that, that will be forthcoming next month. Thank you. Back to the council table. 
comments. I see none. So we do have a, a motion on the floor. I could put that to the, uh, to the vote. So uh, ward boundary review and recommendation, the motion that's on the floor, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. And we did not lift 7-6 or 7-7. So we'll move on to bylaws. And I'll ask for your help here, Clerk, because you've put in a, a few uh, extra ones. That's so certainly. please go ahead. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, so uh, bylaws uh, pre being presented to council for uh, three readings and passing. Um, would be uh, bylaw number, one moment, my apologies. One would think after all this time, I would have this in front of me. Um, but I was riveted by the other uh, discussions um, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so um, uh, bylaw number uh, 9721 being the bylaw to amend the um, Municipality of Sulaco Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw number 85-18 uh, as amended, uh, 89 Voyagers North Road East. And bylaw number 98, sorry, bylaw number 99-21 uh, being the bylaw uh, to amend bylaw number 84-18 being a bylaw to adopt an official plan for the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulaco as amended, uh, respecting the 10 First Avenue South or Forest Inn application. And for, um, as well as bylaw number 98-21 uh, being a bylaw to amend uh, the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulaco Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw number 85-18 as amended, um, again for the 10 First, First Avenue South um, Sunset Inn application. And finally, bylaw number 103-21 being a bylaw to dissolve Ward 1 Hudson, the only remaining ward within the municipality of Sulaco, effective for the 2022 general municipal election. Moved by. Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? Carried. So we're to Councillor. Uh, Council reports before we move into closed session. Um, Councilor Lego. Yeah, not too much. Just had the special council meeting and then a uh, committee of adjustment meeting yesterday. So that was uh, all that I had going on. Thank you. Councilor Bath. Uh, not much to me. Um... We haven't had a PACE meeting until we'll be having it this next week and Hydro is tomorrow. So I really don't have anything that's happened since our last meeting. I have time, I guess. Councillor Fenman. Uh, Community of Adjustment uh, had a meeting on Tuesday and LCC meeting uh, with meet with the MNR on uh, Tuesday last week too. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Not the usual boards of um, the um, hospital board and the library board, which is an ongoing uh, issue of trying to get the library back open. We've advertised for uh, new staff. Uh, the um, environment committee, we didn't have quorum for the second time in the 16 years I've been on that environment committee, we did not have quorum. Well, that's the second time we've had to cancel that meeting. <laughs> and um, myself and another member, we uh, worked on a um, an article for the newspaper on for waste reduction week. Um, let's see, we had a TRC meeting a few weeks ago and um, that's about it. I wasn't able to attend any of the, um, of the, uh, Recon Tooth and Reconciliation Day week events. but uh, So that was my month. Thank you. Thank you. Council Cassidy. Uh, yeah, for me, it was a couple special council meetings. Uh, I wasn't able to attend the entirety of the, the housing strategy put on, or the Kenora District housing strategy, but I, I did attend a bit of it. 
um, some good discussion there. Um, and yeah, as Councillor Timson mentioned, no quorum for Environment Committee. And I did take in um, a ceremony on Truth and Reconciliation Day on September 30th at the um, by the Rotary Park there as well. So um, the other thing has been doing some work and getting ready for um, the uh, SIJHL um, exhibition game that'll be coming this Saturday. So hoping for a good turnout there as well. So. Thank you, Councillor Howley. It's been a relatively quiet month. Com committee's under review, looking forward to uh, that staff report. I did discuss some of the items on the agenda tonight with uh, with some of the constituents, which actually their, their uh, opinions were all in line with the decisions of council. So good work, You're doing the right thing. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just advocating everybody uh, to uh, you know, continue to, to get out there be proactive in, in their local politics. And it's a very political time. So um, yeah, just be safe. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, for myself, I participated in um, two AMO Health Task Force meetings uh, dealing with long-term care and Ontario health teams. And there's another one coming up on Monday dealing with uh, the opioids crisis. Uh, health unit fed executive and board meetings and the usual uh, COVID call that the health unit puts out for municipalities. Um, met with MTO with the CAO on a video call update on our AMO delegation regarding the various projects that are uh, the, the overpass uh, reconstruction and the uh, traffic lights. The CAO I think has updated council on, on the results of that. KDSB, we're uh, on a committee to get the strategic plan underway for the KDSB and uh, met with the friendship accord with KDSB on the work that uh, uh, that the uh, KDSB is doing regarding uh, connectivity for, uh, for communities and, and individuals. Uh, council, we had a special meeting. We all came to an M3C uh, uh, coordination committee meeting. MNDM uh, met with as a follow another follow up to AMO. This was uh, they requested a meeting as a follow up and met with parliamentary assistant to uh, Minister uh, Rickford and PP Dave Smith, Peterborough and Carwarthers regarding something we'd uh, advocated for, which is a rational plan for all weather road development uh, to the north. Uh, that uh, our our concern that we've been expressing is that municipalities be taken into account so that existing service patterns uh, are taken into account and, and not disrupted that enhances the economy uh, of our communities not not destroys it and that it it's for the advantage of the communities in the north uh, and let the mine mining roads and others spin off those roads I'm just trying to sow a seed and put it on the table I met with uh, newly returned uh, our MP Eric Malello last uh, this this week Monday uh, and really, we focused on decided to focus on two things: one being housing, uh, uh, do what we can for housing, and the other was policing costs. Uh, we had a policing police services board meeting today, and uh, some interesting discussion there um, regarding um, uh, incarcerations and calls for service for that we don't feel our municipal responsibility and 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 putting police uh, at risk. So we're going to be working with uh, agencies to uh, to look at dealing with it's really, it's whether it be detox or safe houses or alternatives to, to incarcerating um, people who are there for a purely liquor license act or if they're intoxicated to, to the point where it's a risk. Um, and TRC, we had the, uh, we've had a TRC committee meeting and we had the TRC uh, sort of facilitated a week of events. Uh, certainly we did the, on September 30th, uh, uh, did the flag raising at the TIC for the flag that Garnet Angekinab uh, um, was able to, um, he was given from the, the national level, uh, from the National Council on Truth and Reconciliation, I think it is. Um, so that's uh, flying at the TIC below the, the Laxul flag. That was the month. And now we're moving, I think, into closed session. I suppose we might move into closed session and then take a short, a short break and then come back. So let's get into closed session first uh, to uh, discuss matters of a general nature as noted below. 
moving into closed session at 7.58 p.m. to discuss subject matter relating to a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, section 239-2K, one item, airport matters. And second matter, subject matter relating to labor relations or employee negotiations pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, section 239-2D, one item, staffing matters. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. All in favor? We are now in closed session and we will take a five minute break and resume the meeting at uh, 8.05 p.m. Oh, the, the direction, the motions, the direction given to staff relative to the items presented in closed session on October 20th, 2021. Clerk. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, with respect to airport matters and staffing matters is how that resolution would end. Thank you. Moved by. Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? Carried. Confirmatory bylaw, the bylaw number 102-21 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Silicon October 20th, 2021 regular council meeting be read a first, second and third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. All in favor? Carried. And other than our next regular meeting, I'm not sure when we'll meet again, but we'll meet again in a, about a month's time. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Hello. Good night. Good night.